Um, okay, everyone. So sorry about that. We were just uh, uh, um, a couple of slight uh, technical gremlins, but they're sorted now. So uh, my name is Liam Delaney. Um, I'm professor of economics here in UCD. When I say here, I'm in my kitchen, but you know what I mean. So in in UCD, but uh, and um, also direct the behavior science group at the UCD Geary Institute. Uh, so the, the purpose of today's session, uh, so it's part of a wider set of conferences that are, uh, we've organized uh, as a collaboration with University of Limerick and uh, with uh, the UCD Geary Institute. So we're really looking at a wide set of issues uh, around the crisis response to COVID. So we've had sessions across areas like fiscal policy, um, human rights issues, issues around uh, next week mental health, citizens participation. So uh, the purpose of this session is to look at, uh, really from a behavioral science and psychology perspective, issues around uh, the restrictions, both as, as they've operated, as they might operate, uh, factors that might be uh, involved. So uh, many of you who are in, in the attendees have been part of our behavioral science network over the years where we've had many sessions. Uh, and it's really to try to draw from those perspectives. So we've got three uh, very strong speakers, uh, Professor Molly Byrne, who's head of the uh, NUIG Health Behaviour Change Group, uh, Professor Orla Muldoon, who's the founding chair and head of the Department of Psychology at the University of Limerick, and then uh, Professor Pete Lunn, who runs the uh, Behavioural Research Unit at the Economic and Social Research Institute. So how it's going to work is uh, I'm going to ask each of the speakers to speak for uh, about 15 minutes in turn. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, Please don't use the chat function, use the, um, use the Q&A function. And then after the three speakers have spoken, I will, I will read out uh, questions uh, to them. Uh, so I'm going to begin with, um, with Professor Byrne. Okay, thanks, Liam. Uh, so I'm going to attempt now to share my screen. Um, So it says, Liam, that host has disabled participant sharing screen. Um, I don't know, do you need to click something there? That should, that should be fine now if you, uh, sorry about that. Uh, Oh, great. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And thanks very much, Liam, for bringing us together. And hopefully, um, what we cover today will be an interesting session for us all. Um, as Liam says, my name is Molly Byrne, and I'm a health psychologist and professor in NUI Galway and director of the Health Behaviour Change Research Group. So I suppose the application of behavioural science to looking at behaviour change interventions is, is really our bread and butter business. Um, so the key questions that I'm going to look at uh, in this brief presentation are a very broad look at what behavioural science can tell us about how to increase adherence to the range of public health measures uh, to reduce COVID-19. I'm then going to look uh, briefly at what we know about people's awareness, attitudes, beliefs and behaviours in a more global perspective, and I'm going to tell you uh, the initial results of a global study that uh, we've been involved in. And then at the end, I'm going to finish up by talking a little bit about what we know about how we can all survive, I suppose, focusing more on mental health uh, as we all deal with the restrictions uh, in place due to COVID-19. Um, Liam, you might just tell me if the quality, you know, if in terms of just to ensure that people can hear me and, and see, see stuff clearly. Yes. Is it sounding all right? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Great. Okay, thanks very much. So I suppose the first one then, so what can behavioural science tell us about how to increase adherence to these public health measures? And this is very much what within the National Public Health Emergency Team Behavioural Change subgroup that Liam has mentioned, this is very much our focus. So this is a small group of people coming from behavioral economics, psychology, social psychology, uh, other social sciences, trying to advise um, in terms of the national response. And I have to say it's been 
uh, a really impressive team to be part of. Um, and I think in general, the Irish response to the COVID-19 emergency has been in general very impressive. I think we've just managed to get a lot of things up and running very quickly. Um, so it's been really brilliant to be part of that. Um, so, you know, behaviour is very core to COVID-19. I just did a quick search last night on COVID-19 and behaviour on Google Scholar. And I mean, we're really talking about within the last few months, there's been about 2,000 uh, outputs uh, specifically around COVID-19 and behaviour. So this is very much a global focus, very uh, critical, I suppose, to um, how we um, manage to survive this, this pandemic. So I suppose very high levels of awareness that behaviour is very much at the centre of all aspects of prevention uh, and surviving uh, the pandemic. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there and it, it can be easy to be, I suppose, overwhelmed by the literature. Um, I often fall back to um, a, a framework from behavioral science called the behavior change wheel. So this is a framework which helps to structure an evidence-based approach to look at developing any kind of behavior change intervention. So this is a framework that we've used very commonly in our work. Uh, it's a synthesis really of over 90 behavioral science frameworks used in the first instance, the green wheel in the middle, to understand the predictors of behavior. So these are the capability, opportunity and motivation factors. This is a critical first step before we then move to identifying in a systematic way intervention functions or policy responses that might address these predictors of the behavior. Uh, the behavior change wheel, I suppose, disciplines us and encourage us, it encourages us to take this really systematic focus of looking at, in the first instance, the critical thing is to be very specific about the behavior that we're targeting. So even within our response to COVID-19, there's a wide range of behaviors, hand hygiene, social distancing. Uh, these behaviors are things that um, are likely to have very different predictors and therefore require a whole suite of different responses. But I suppose the key thing here is that we need to be very specific about each of the types of different behaviours and that we develop strategies to address all the predictors or barriers to those behaviours. So this really just shows the systematic steps that we need to, to move through towards, first of all, specifying and understanding the behaviour and then developing uh, our response, so our public health response. So uh, Susan Mickey uh, is the author of, of the Behaviour Change Wheel and, and uh, has produced a number of really, I think, really useful papers over the last month or so. Uh, and I suppose this first blog in the BMJ was around uh, the importance of specifying the behaviour. So what she's tried to do here is look at the categories of behaviours. So things around even just looking at maintaining hygiene. So instead of trying to come up with a public health response to how can we get people to maintain hygiene, we really need to break that down into the very specifics of cleaning hands. So what do we need to do to ensure we can clean our hands? We need to ensure that there's soap and water, we need to carry moisturizer, we need to carry sanitizer. Um, and she goes through a number of, of the behaviors using and disposing of tissues and cleaning of surfaces. So I suppose the point here is that we need to be as specific as possible about our behaviors and the more specific we can be, the clearer we can be about the predictors and therefore hopefully the more effective we can be in developing um, our responses. So I won't go through the detail of that, but there's also, I suppose, uh, in that uh, blog, um, specifying behaviors around avoiding touching. So this is touching faces, touching surfaces, and then specifying behaviors uh, around social distancing. Um, once we have been more clear around the behavioral requirements, what exactly is being asked of people uh, in response to COVID-19, we then move into trying to understand, okay, well, why are these behaviors happening or not happening? Uh, and this is the COMB model, and this is at the center of the behavior change wheel. So really, according to this model, what we're seeing here is that for any behavior to happen, so say we take hand good hand hygiene practice, an individual needs to have the capability to do that behavior. They need to be motivated to do it. 
and they need to have the opportunity. So the capability and motivation are very much things that are intrinsic to people, whereas the opportunity is something that uh, usually lies much more in the environment. So to look at those in a small bit more detail, the capability can either be physical capability. So do I have the physical skills to do the proper hand washing? Do I have the psychological capability? So do I have the knowledge of why I need to be doing the hand hygiene? Uh, do I have the knowledge of exactly why the different measures in, in relation to hand, keeping good hand hygiene are important? Looking then at mo motivation factors. So these can be broken down into either automatic or reflective. So automatic factors, uh, relevant to motivation are um, what automatic processes um, are there to make sure I, I do what I need to do. So when I come into the house, do I immediately, just habitually go to the bathroom and wash my hands? Reflective then are processes around, do I believe it's important to wash my hands? Uh, what are my uh, attitudes and beliefs about that? Do I actually believe that washing my hands is making my hands a bit raw and dry? And actually that's a stronger belief than believing that it's very important for me to do it. Finally, then opportunity variables uh, can fall into either social, social opportunity or, fit, or physical opportunity. So social opportunity here, and I think certainly in the response to COVID-19, social opportunity is critically important. So this is about whether I feel other people are doing it. Uh, is it a cultural norm and would people disapprove if I didn't do it? And then finally, physical opportunity, does my environment allow me to, to do it when I need to do it? So if I'm out working in a van and I have no access to a tap, soap, running water, uh, am I able to wash my hands as I need to do? So according to the behaviour change wheel, ensuring that all of these are in place is critical to ensure that the behaviour can happen. And in my experience, this has provided a really, really useful framework for ensuring that we have the full gamut uh, of considerations in developing our behaviours and responses. There are a number of behavioural principles which I think um, dictate behavioural change across the board. And again, there's another useful blog from Susan Mickey um, looking at applying these behaviour change principles uh, to ensuring that we have effective communication around behaviour change for COVID-19. The first is to ensure that people have a clear mental model of how COVID-19 is transmitted, how they can actually act to prevent the transmission. So people need to be informed enough to understand why social distancing is important, why, why hand hygiene is important. Creating social norms then, uh, we're very much uh, social creatures. Uh, social norms can be incredibly powerful. We're very unlikely to be uh, rigidly following hand hygiene guidance if we feel that most people are not doing this. Creating the right level and type of emotion is critically important. And I will talk about this a little bit at the end when looking at mental health as well, is that um, in terms of increasing motivation, it's uh, much easier to tap into people's positive motivation about how they can really make a difference. Um, Principle four then is about that it's easier to replace a behavior than just get rid of a behavior. So instead of saying, for example, uh, we need to stop touching our faces, it might be easier to give out the message that we need to keep our hands below shoulder level. So in terms of framing a behavior as a, as a what behavior do we need to do as opposed to what behavior do we have to stop doing. And then finally, a basic principle of just making the behavior easy. And I think certainly nationally, we're moving from, um, you know, over the next few weeks, we're going to be moving from, in a way, very challenging set of behaviours associated with quite a, a, an absolute lockdown. But I suppose one of the benefits of the situation in which we're currently in is it is relatively easy to be very clear about what we need to do because the guidelines are very straightforward and they're very similar for all of us. So uh, a key thing, I suppose, is to try and make the behaviours as easy as possible. So moving on then to the next section. You happy enough, Liam, for me to move on? Is that? Yeah, great. So I suppose, what do we know um, from a global perspective about what people are thinking, what they believe, and in relation to their behaviours? And, you know, I suppose one of the very silver lining pieces of the whole COVID-19 pandemic is just the incredible international collaboration among a full range of scientific communities. 
uh, and certainly this has been the same, I think, among social and behavioral scientists. Um, one study that we have been involved in in the Health Behaviour Change Research Group, and this study has actually been endorsed by uh, the NEFIT Behaviour Change subgroup as well, is the eye care study. So this was a study that was set up about four weeks ago now by Simon Bacon and Kim Lavoie, who are based in the Montreal Behavioural Medicine Centre. And they've pulled together a really impressive team of about 100 behavioural scientists internationally uh, to set up this global survey. Um, they're planning to do four waves of the survey and the first wave has been completed at this stage. They're hoping to target uh, 100,000 people in total. I suppose the benefit of the global perspective in a survey like this is that it allows us to look at the different approaches that different countries are taking and seeing how they may impact on attitudes, responses. So, I mean, it's, it's a potentially very rich data set. So very briefly then, in terms of the preliminary overview of the results from the first wave. So these really only went on the website yesterday. And these are data that uh, were collected up until April 15th. So they've managed to collect data from 20,000 people um, from around 40 uh, countries around the world. Um, I'm going to go through just a few highlights, I suppose, of these. And I think a key finding, and I mean, certainly, I think in terms of the data that we're finding in, in various national surveys, this very much reflects this, is that in general, the public really actually believe these strict measures that governments have taken internationally are about right. And certainly in some countries, uh, maybe the, the public would actually prefer the measures to be stronger. So I suppose there's you know, maybe some, you know, intuitive belief that people think, oh, I wish we didn't have to do all of this. The research would certainly suggest that in general, the public really buy into these measures and believes that, that believe that these are really important measures for us all to take. Then looking at self-reported um, COVID-19 mitigation behaviours, and again, these are always, you know, problematic. And within the group, we've talked about the problem of self-report measures about hand hygiene. I mean, who really at this stage is going to say no, that they're not washing their hands? But what I think these data can be quite interesting about is that I think they can flag behaviours that the public are going to struggle more with. And I think one of them in particular is social distancing. I think this is a really challenging behaviour. If you think of all the opportunity and motivation factors that might be relevant to social distancing, um, I, I think that this is going to prove a very challenging behaviour. And obviously, it, this is going to be a very important behaviour uh, in, in certainly the, the medium uh, future for us all. Looking then about people's concerns about COVID-19, so again, these very much reflect what I would know of the national data, that really we're less concerned uh, for ourselves as, as, as individuals, and we're more concerned about the impact that we might have through not following these behaviours on other people, on our communities. So I think that that brings a really important uh, point to developing our public health response because I think uh, by motivating people, by um, presenting messages in terms of that you're doing this to protect other people who you care for, who you love for your community, uh, is, is a very motivating way to frame messages. And I think it is one that certainly in Ireland, uh, we, we definitely have taken. In terms of where people are getting their information, and I know at a national level, RTE have been doing, um, you know, have been playing a complete blinder on this and, and would be, certainly where most people are getting their information. From a global perspective, yes, health authorities, governments, and national uh, media are very important. Um, then finally, I think on these, the measures most likely to convince people. So again, how to motivate people. And we can see that the, most, the highest ranking uh, measures there are really ensuring that people are informed about how, they, how COVID-19 is spread and informed about how what they do impacts on what's going to happen at a, a global uh, and national level. So I suppose, again, this has been one that nationally in Ireland, I think we have um, called really well in that the threat of fines, the threat of being caught by the guards is, comes much lower down in terms of how motivated people are um, by those measures in terms of ensuring that they practice their social distancing and physical distancing. 
So just to say that there will be a second wave of this survey, uh, my understanding is that it's going out early next week. Uh, we're really looking for a large response to this nationally. Uh, and certainly I, over social media, I will share links to that, but it would be really great if people online today could complete that survey uh, and send it on to others, because I do think having that data from the national and allowing us to compare it uh, with an international sample is, is really valuable to our, our national work. So the final piece then, I suppose, thinking about the mental health outcomes. Um, we're all living in very strange times. Uh, there are many people facing challenges around anxiety, depression, dealing with just real practical things, homeschooling, dealing with living in very small living environments, uh, dealing with real economic worries and threats. So um, mental health is a really important thing that we need to be measuring at the minute in terms of the national response to COVID-19 and then also to the restrictions that are coming into place as a result of COVID-19. So do events like COVID-19 pandemic, what do we know about whether they're associated with poor mental health outcomes? So the research would be pretty consistent on this, that things like COVID-19 are associated with adverse physical and mental health outcomes over time. Um, there has been already a number of studies uh, published from China, which shows that uh, there has been a significant mental health burden uh, associated with COVID-19 particularly among groups. Um, so the high risk groups here would be among younger people. They seem to struggle, uh, experience a lot more stress and anxiety in terms of dealing with the restrictions. Obviously people who spend more time on the epidemic and healthcare workers. So I suppose people who are surrounded with it, they have no escape, no distraction, are more likely to uh, bear the brunt of that mental health burden. So I suppose, what can we do about this? Um, there was actually a very nice rapid review just very recently published uh, in which they um, synthesized the evidence from six key uh, studies in this area. And I suppose the, the consistent messages coming out is that it's really important that we regulate our exposure to COVID related media. I mean, I think for most of us, we're, starting to be a little more limited uh, in terms of our, our exposure to media. I think at the very start of the pandemic, uh, many of us um, found it hard not to engage in it in the con on a constant basis, but this would seem to be an important um, guideline in terms of trying to increase positive mental health outcomes. Maintaining a strong social network, and I know that there's been discussion around uh, the difference between calling it social distancing and physical distancing, and there seems to be some level of preference for physical distancing as really advocating social distancing is not what we want to do at this time. We want to encourage people to maintain their networks, but obviously just with physical distancing, they need to find other ways to do that. And I suppose for different groups that can be harder or easier. Perhaps there are some older people who don't have the access to the online uh, resources that can facilitate uh, that online social network. And then in relation to looking after ourselves, uh, there's been some research looking at the effects of um, uh, the COVID restrictions in terms of health, other health behaviours. So this, these are things like exercising, eating, consuming alcohol. Um, and I suppose the guidance here is that if we can, whatever we can do to try and maintain our physical health uh, will benefit our mental health outcome. There's quite a bit of discussion in the media at the minute, uh, I think about perhaps unhealthy coping strategies, such as, um, I mean, I think we're hearing that we're consuming alcohol as if it was Christmas or St. Patrick's Day on a regular basis. I mean, I don't know the validity of those statistics, but certainly um, uh, the, the, the guidance here would be that we need to try and avoid these and find alternative coping strategies. And I suppose a key thing here is of trying to find things that we enjoy um, I mean, that's a fundamental uh, psychological principle that we need to do things we enjoy to maintain uh, positive mental health. Um, so just uh, finishing up, I suppose a, a key thing is that we need to keep things positive. We need to frame this in a positive way. It's, um, um, I suppose there's a danger of uh, catastrophizing in the current situation. Uh, and I, I suppose it, 
the, the evidence would suggest that keeping things positive, finding opportunities to amplify positive and hopeful stories uh, and presenting the difficult restrictions that we're all being presented with, with some level of light at the end of the tunnel, uh, I think is very important for any kind of public uh, health strategy at the moment. So thanks very much and I look forward to the discussion following this. Th thanks Molly. Um, so uh, we move on to Pete Lunn. So if you uh, just yeah stop the screen share and then Pete, you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, is that working? Uh, yeah, that's working, Pete. I can see you, so you're all good. Okay, great. So <laughs> my machine tells me that I'm talking to 77 people. Um, my brain, in 76 now, my brain <laughs> obviously didn't start very well. So my, my brain is finding that almost impossible to believe. Um, because of so, I guess I'm getting so little feedback from other people, which is of course what I normally get in most social circumstances and when I'm going about my professional life. Um, and I'm not just sort of saying this because I'm talking off the top of my head about how I'm feeling. I'm saying this because this is going to be important to what I'm actually going to say in the talk. Um, one of the things that's extremely difficult at the moment about these restrictions is that we cannot see what everyone else is doing and we're not getting any feedback. And I'm going to make a big point about that and I'm going to come back to that. My focus here, I think Molly's work there on um, mental health and what's being said there is exceedingly important. We can see very, very large well-being drops. I'm not going to focus on those. I'm going to focus overwhelmingly on promoting compliance because compliance is what's saving lives. And I'm a behavioral scientist, not an epidemiologist. So I'm taking what I get from the epidemiological models at face value that compliance with social distancing is saving lives, which it appears to me to be doing. And I'm going to concentrate on promoting it. Um, quite early on in this crisis, me and my team published this paper. Um, it's in the Journal of Behavioral Public Administration and the link to it is there. It's an open access journal. It was a very rapid review of how behavioral science might be able to help fight the coronavirus. And I think overwhelmingly that the biggest point really that the, the review makes is that almost all of the behaviors that we are talking about here and almost all of the response that we are producing is what would a behavioral scientist would call a classic collective action problem or a common pool resource problem or a public good game. In other words, we are all in a situation where the outcomes for all of us and for society as a whole are dictated by all of our individual actions where what is being required of us is that we all make some sacrifice for the common good. And these kind of social dilemmas, these kind of common pool resource problems, th these are things that social scientists have now studied for 30 years or so and in that paper, we round up some of the evidence about whether people do or do not cooperate to achieve uh, good social outcomes. So everyone needs to make those individual sacrifices for the collective good. And what the research suggests is that there are key things that improve it, key things that make it more likely that we will make those sacrifices. Uh, one of them is repeated and clear communication of why the action that is concerned is best for all. And I think particularly in a, a long protracted ongoing social dilemma like we are in at the moment where we are expecting people and encouraging people to make sacrifices that could last for weeks or months on end. It, it bears repeating that this is really, really important. Keeping front and center why we are doing this and what we're trying to achieve and why it is the best strategy for everybody is really important. We know this from 30 years of science that shows that that repeated communication is vital to keeping compliance high, to keeping cooperation high. We also know that the stronger people feel like they're part of a collective and part of a collective group. And I think all are in the talk that follows will say more about this. I think this is also a very important part of keeping compliance high and keeping people willing to make sacrifices for the common good. And there's a lot of evidence that suggests this. And finally, some degree of punishment for non-compliance is required, even if that is only social disapproval. We know that where there are uh, people who don't comply, 
there are a lot of other people who are what's called conditional cooperators, which means they will make sacrifices for the common good, provided they see that everyone else is doing that. And if they see too many people not complying, they themselves, when it comes to marginal calls, will also start to not comply and will also not produce the kind of behaviors that we need people to produce. So these are things that we've known from repeated experiments in multiple contexts for many years. Uh, ironically enough, you know, it also turns out that a sense of crisis helps. So we know from studies of past crises that where there are crises, people do tend to pull together as communities and have stronger group identity. Although this is a particularly big crisis and it is a particularly challenging one in terms of the degree of behavior change we are expecting for a long period of time. But there is literature there that suggests that people do pull together and solve these kind of collective action problems better during a crisis. And as Molly referred to, I mean, I think I would, and I would echo, I think Ireland's response so far has been excellent from the point of view of what we could have expected at the start. I have to say though, if I'm honest, I now have a real sense of worry about where we're at. Um, now that may just be an immediate response to the last 24 hours, but the response to the comments that were made about uh, complacency and the dangers of complacency, um, if anything, as far as I can see, we are fraying slightly more at the edges in the last 24 or 48 hours. And as we come into another warm weather weekend, I do worry about the degree of compliance. There are huge numbers of messages coming into media outlets that were being quoted this morning about people out and about not seeing people complying. And the effect that has on the willingness of others to comply is something I worry about and I think is really important. Because there is one big difference here. Um, and this goes back to my point about not believing that there are 76 people listening to me right now because my senses don't tell me that. And the really big difference is this. This is a collective action problem in which we don't get feedback. So we're being asked to wash our hands more, to keep our social distance, to not go to work, uh, to homeschool. We're being asked to do all of these things because what it does is reduces infection. And yet individuals get essentially no feedback at all on whether their actions are actually reducing infection. And all of those common resource problems I referred to earlier and public good problems I referred to earlier, is typically the case that round after round of these games that we have people play where we put people in social dilemmas or when we study most social dilemmas that are in field studies or our case studies, the society that you're talking about actually gets some feedback on how well it's doing on a regular basis and even the individuals do that they put their contributions in they see how much they get back they see how well the collective pool is expanding they see the social benefit one of the great problems here is that in fact we don't we don't really see the benefit and we don't really see what the counterfactual is if somebody saves lives by grabbing a toddler who's about to run into the street they will get a huge adrenaline hit and there'll be a visceral feedback response to what they've just done. If you save lives by washing your hands, you may never know that you washed the virus off your hands. If you save lives by not taking a journey that you're otherwise gonna take, you will never know that you saved lives by not taking that journey. So we don't have that feedback. It's an abstract theoretical idea that we're using to motivate people. And in terms of trying to motivate people over the long term, this causes me some problems. And there are, streams of literature that show people's difficulties reasoning with counterfactuals and bringing what's called hidden evidence into their own statistical thinking about how the world works which is to say understanding evidence about what is not happening and that you cannot see as well as what is happening and what you can and that makes this particular collective action problem particularly difficult that leads you to ask can we provide it can we get better feedback to people in, per in terms of numbers and lives saved I certainly would advocate that it would be really useful if we can, even if it's a guesstimate, even if it comes with huge error bars from a model, if we can be giving people more feedback about how many lives their behavior is saving against a counterfactual without social distancing, regardless of model assumptions. I think giving people ordinary realistic feedback about what's happening could make a real difference here. Um, and it's a worry because of the long period of time that we've got to engage in these behaviors, and also because of the large well-being loss, which Liam's work in particular and other people's work as well has now measured, whereby we can really see that the restrictions that we are placing on people's lives are causing really quite substantial well-being losses. So giving them feedback on continually on why it matters and why it's being successful and how I think is really important. Okay. I'm going to switch gear a little bit because one contribution we've tried to make to, to that is a messaging experiment that we ran at the end of March. 
Um, and I'm just going to put this up for a couple of reasons. One, because it gives another motivation. So I've talked about feedback, but it gives other motivations uh, that we might be able to propagate for why these behaviours are so important and to try to keep people compliant during these restrictions. But it also gives some indication that it is possible to ask very specific research questions and answer them quickly in this crisis and feed evidence into ongoing messaging to try and uh, ensure compliance and help people to comply. So this is again is freely available online if you're interested in the paper. It's a fairly simple paper and a fairly simple experiment that we conducted online. Uh, essentially, we had an online sample, a representative national sample of about 500 people who saw one of three posters. So one of them, the control condition was this poster, which is a standard informational poster encouraging people and explaining to people how they should socially distance standing two meters apart. You would doubtless recognize the branding on this. This is essentially the kind of poster that the HSC have been using. Uh, we contrasted that with um, a third of the, pop of the sample who saw this poster, which has an emotional manipulation embedded into it. Now, actually, there's substantial literature that shows that when people worry about causing harm to others, they worry about it more and it influences their behavior more if those others are made in some way specific. So if they're not statistics, but if they're a specific individual or something that people can really get a kind of emotional handle on. So you'll see the way we designed this poster was we have people not keeping their social distance, one of whom is infected but doesn't know it yet. And we then tell a story of infection that identifies a particular vulnerable other. So somebody who's going to contract this disease precisely because of this social meeting, um, who has an undiagnosed heart condition, or somebody else who's going to contract the disease because they're a doctor and they're therefore in vulnerable frontline services. Or if you go to the bottom left panel, it's going to get passed on to somebody's granny, the bottom right one, someone who, who's asthmatic. So the idea here was to try and give concrete, specific, quite emotionally charged examples of when not keeping social distancing might actually result in a vulnerable specific person being infected because the evidence suggests from other domains, other contexts, the evidence suggests that where you make the story a specific one about individuals who are identified, it's more motivating. And then at the bottom it says there are small changes will save the people we care about stay two meters apart. A third of people also then saw this efficacy manipulation. So Another thing we know from the psychological literature is that people really struggle to understand exponential relationships. Uh, infection is by its nature exponential. If someone infects three other people and they infect three other people and so on, it's three, nine, 27 and on you go. And this is a logic that people we know intuitively struggle with. So the idea of this poster was to try to get that across more. So again, it's the same people um, not engaging in the social distancing behavior they should. And now it says, we'll now pass this on to six others. Uh, we'll now pass this on to colleagues and they'll give it to their families. We'll now infect three people. They will infect nine, who will infect 27 and so on. So this is a manipulation which is trying to get across the efficacy of interrupting that exponential, um, that exponential uh, infection. So we call this an efficacy manipulation. In a way, I think the fact that we did that probably is not completely accurate because although the previous one is an emotional manipulation in the sense that it is identifying vulnerable people who get infected, I, I think this is a pretty emotional manipulation too. I think if you felt that you were responsible for infecting three, nine, 27 others in an exponential relationship, you might think twice about what you're doing on an emotional level as well as on a rational level, but we're gonna call this the efficacy manipulation anyway. So this is a simple randomized trial where people are randomized to see one of these three posters. Now, um, did they like the posters? Uh, we wanted, we, they thought during the experiment that what they were being asked to do was actually evaluate the posters. Um, which was not the primary outcome variable of interest, but we also wanted to see whether if our posters were differentially effective, whether it was just because some were more appealing than others based on the images or the messages or so on. Uh, actually, the two treatment posters, people hated them uh, relative to the control poster. So people much prefer the control poster, the emotional poster, and the efficacy poster. Significantly, uh, people didn't think these posters would be effective. Uh, they also didn't think they would be as memorable. So in general, people thought that this would not be an effective campaign or a memorable campaign. If we went with the manipulated ones, they preferred the control poster. Okay, but what actually happened to people's behavior? Now we can't directly measure behavior. What we can do is measure behavioral intentions. 
Um, and that's what we did. We measured behavioral intentions and we measured people's judgments of acceptability of the behavior of others. Where what we'd done was we'd asked um, the HSE focus groups for behaviors at the time, and this experiment was done just before the latest restrictions were put on, behaviors at the time that people thought were marginal behaviors. That is ones where they weren't sure whether it was okay or not. And we asked them whether they were intending to engage in those behaviors over the next two or three days. So that was things like meeting up with a friend uh, in the open air for a chat. Uh, and also um, with behaviors that they might not themselves engage in, for example, allowing children to play with other children in the street. Um, we asked them for judgments of the acceptability of other people's behavior. So this is what that looked like here at the marginal behaviors. We had people judging whether they, you know, saying whether they definitely will or definitely will not engage in a behavior that they might themselves. And then we had them judging the acceptability of whether it would be okay for other people to engage in marginal behaviors. For example, is it okay for people to travel to their parents' house for a cup of tea and a chat? So these are the outcome variables that we used. And the question is, did being exposed to one of the three posters differentially affect people's judgments of the acceptability of social distancing behaviors, marginal behaviors, and their own intentions to do it over the next few days? They didn't, I think, know that the things that we measured later in the study, these outcome variables were the primary things that we were interested in. The whole experiment was couched as the primary things we were interested in was feedback on the campaign, which they provide us, provided us with and showed that they really didn't like our treatment posters that we developed. Okay, uh, so we made two indices out of these variables, an index of caution for people's own behavior. By caution, I mean intending themselves to engage more in social distancing and an index of caution for others' behavior, which is how acceptable do they find other people's behavior, whether they find it unacceptable, uh, these marginal behaviors, then we're going to say they're more cautious about social distance. Okay, so what happened? So the results look like this. Here we have the control group. I'm going to split people by caution into high, medium, and low categories. So are they highly cautious, are they medium caution or low caution for their own actions, what they themselves are going to do over the next few days? The ones who saw the control poster, that's how they split across the three categories. The ones who got the emotional manipulation split like that. The ones who got the efficacy manipulation split like that. That's a statistically significant treatment effect for our posters where we've changed more than one in five people who were not in the high caution category into people who were in the high caution category. If we move on to look at other people's actions, Here's the control group. So when judging the acceptability of other people's interactions, they split this way across high, medium, and low categories. Those that saw the emotion poster uh, increased the number in the high category. Those that saw, saw the effectiveness poster, the efficacy poster rather, also increased the numbers in the higher category. And again, that was a statistically significant difference. I really want to make a point here over and above the fact that those particular manipulations were effective. So it, it seems that in terms of people's intentions for how they're going to socially distance and their acceptability judgments of other people's social distancing, it certainly looks like an emotional manipulation that has a specific potential victim in a vulnerable category or a manipulation that highlights how many other people someone might infect by not engaging in social distancing. Those are effective, but they're effective in circumstances where the individuals concerned expected them to be less effective than the informational poster. They thought the informational poster was more effective, but when it came to their own judgments and responses, actually the two treatment posters were more effective. And I think this really matters. If you look at the international survey results that Molly presented in the previous presentation, you'll see that people have a strong preference for information and say that information is the basis on which they make their judgments. What we often know from behavioral science is that people like to believe that. They like to believe they make rational judgments based on information. What you can see here is that manipulations that were much more about why is it important to do this and have a strong emotional component as well as an efficacy component were actually more effective in terms of getting people to think about their behavior and getting people to be more cautious about social distancing. Okay, the take homes and what I've said, we're in a collective action problem. I think we've done remarkably well so far. I certainly think we've done substantially better than some of our nearest neighbors, but challenges really do remain. This is a highly unstable situation in which non-compliance could cause unraveling and many more people to not comply. We're in a situation where there is a lack of feedback on top of that. People cannot see the successes of their own behavior in a collective 
compassion problem where they are making sacrifices for others. And this gives me cause for concern. Um, we need to keep the primary motivation. Why are we doing this? How is this saving lives? Absolutely front and center in our communication. I think looking at the behavioral science evidence that we have. Um, and we've made some small contribution to that by showing that particular emotional and efficacy manipulations might help to do that in terms of promoting social distancing. Uh, but there is a very long way to go and there's an awful lot more messaging that's going to be required if we're going to sustain the levels of compliance with these restrictions that we've seen so far. Uh, so that's me and thanks very much for your attention. I, I think I do believe that you're actually out there. So thanks very much. <laughs> That was fantastic, Pete. So yeah, if you could just uh, uh, stop uh, sharing your screen there, Pete, and I will. Um, and I think Orla, uh, Orla if, you, uh, if you start sharing yours. Yeah. And just a reminder, uh, everyone, if you'd like to ask questions, just... Um, Can you see it? Just... Um, yeah. So Orla, we can see your slides now. Super. And I think everything's ready to go. So yeah, our, our next speaker is Professor Orla Muldoon, who's the founding chair and head of the uh, Department of Psychology in the University of Limerick. Um, thanks very much, Liam, and thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, I guess um, I, I'll open by saying that um, I'm a social psychologist, so I'm probably um, somewhere between Pete and Molly, um, and some of the things both of them have said I refer to and maybe have a um, slightly different angle. I think all of the things I have to say are complementary, and I think, you know, I, they probably would say the same things. We have all of useful things to say, but this is a complex problem, so the different perspectives can be um, useful. Um, so I'll start by saying that um, much of what um, um, I do work on is not just about what the message is, but maybe how the message is received. So thinking about the people who are hearing things and how the people might hear things differently contingent on the position that they have. Um, and my own research background um, is as somebody who has thought an awful lot about stress and trauma. So I'm sort of a social psychologist with an interest in stress and trauma. Okay, so that's by way of introduction. introduction. Um, so um, when we think about this problem, um, am I, is these, oh, I have to use this to move this. Sorry, I'm, I talk about struggling with the technology. Um, When we think about this crisis, I guess I think there's a number of things about it that are paradoxical. Um, the first one is that we all know this curve. We've seen various versions of it, um, including the one with the cat that I quite like. Um, and it says that we all must act. And that's a really strong message. Everybody must act to save everybody else. Um, but increasingly, we are not, we are aware we're not at equal risk. So from early on, we knew that health backgrounds was important, whether or not you had a pre-existing disorder. Um, but actually what has started to show up quite quickly is that there are risks that are to do with the kind of job you have. Can you work from home? Um, there are risks to do with ethnic group. There's now a huge apparent risk between the global north and the global south. Some people in the global south, for instance, can't afford soap. Um, so this is the first paradox, that we all must act, but we're not at equal risk. And we know that risk is important to whether or not we act. The second big paradox. <clears throat> sorry, is, to, uh, sorry to interrupt, Orla. I, I, yeah. I think we, we may not be seeing your slides transitioning. Uh, I just want to make sure that oh. you... Oh. Oh. Well, I'll try to share again. If you just share screen onto the onto whatever screen that you're looking at. So. Yeah. Now, why is that? Um, I don't know why that is. I 
done very well there. Very um, close. <laughs> very close, yeah. <laughs> oh well. I'm not having okay, I'm going to try again with this one. Now. Now, can you see, what can you see? Yeah, can we can see? see your slide. So just what we weren't seeing was it transitioning. So if you were, if you move. Is anything moving now? No, the slides aren't moving, which I don't, it's a, not an issue before. Um, yeah, okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to stop the share. It's something I'm doing. You can be guaranteed it's something I'm doing. Um, okay, what am I doing wrong? I think if you um, if you just share screen on the on the Zoom um, and then and then uh, just it's just to make sure that you're on the actual screen that you're transitioning. That's the one that you're sharing. Basically, is the is the. Mm. So if you share and then start slideshow. If I share and start, okay. So when I go into share, it's not showing me this. Oh, I see. No, it's not showing me the slides that I want to share now. Uh, I don't know why that is. Share screen. Or if you just want to email it to me, I can put them up for you. Now, is it, can you see them? Yeah, so if you now, if you now you just go to slideshow. On Zoom. No, on the on the um, on the PowerPoint. Yeah. On the PowerPoint, yeah, and so check just, are they moving? Just start slideshow. I didn't. Oh. God, I'm making a mess of this. Sorry, folks. So just up on the yeah. Now, are they moving now? No. No, nope. they're not moving. It's I don't know why this is. Yeah, it's something to do. See, they're moving here for me. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Uh, will I email them through to you again, Liam? Sorry. Yeah, they're moving now, actually, uh, Orla. Oh, <laughs> okay. So what have you got? So now we're, we've got a, a global crisis with national responses. Yeah, so that's okay. So this is my second paradox. So global crisis with, so what I was saying was the first paradox is not an equal risk. The second one is it's a global crisis, um, but we have a national response. And I really like this map, even though these results are out of date, I really like this map because um, here we have a national response as if this line um, that cuts across between North and South actually makes a difference. And I really like the EU coronavirus knows no borders, when actually one of the places where we now have a very real issue is along the border of the EU. Um, so all without any irony. Um, so these kinds of divisions are really important to the crisis, but we're operating at, at, at a national level, but the global issue is really important. So I want to come back to that. And then another paradox is that we're trying to protect the spread of disease and we're prioritizing physical health, but in some, you know, together, and that's good. But at the same time, we're compromising mental health um, because of this social disconnection and isolation at a time of extreme stress for some people, not for all people, because we have this division um, as to who's affected most. So, there's a, the, I suppose that the, the um, last paradox is um, one that I wrote about early on in the crisis is this emphasis on um, the, the need for us all to act in the collective, but actually we need everybody to do their piece. So it's this kind of, let's all do it, but actually are you doing it? So it's, actually, it's a lot of balance required here. Um, so, I'm just going to tell you very briefly about um, some research that we're doing. Um, and it's really underanalyzed because I only just pulled it down this morning. Um, one of the things that um, we would have shown in the past is that 
people acting in solidarity, that that solidarity can be, like Pete said earlier, can be really important to people's mental health. That feeling of being supported and minded and in it with other people is very protective in times of stress. So that is a really strong um, sort of uh, mechanism that supports resilience in terms of uh, psychological well-being. But what we wanted to look at was whether or not it actually supported people, people's um, health behaviour. They, were they more like, likely to comply with public health messaging? So we've collected data with this 1,248 respondents in Ireland, and we have another 500 from the UK that we're just analysing. We also measured things like post-traumatic stress and psychological well-being and lots of other things, but I'm only just telling you about this this morning. And we asked people about their own group memberships too. So we asked them about how Irish they felt. Um, and we had people in our sample that would have been like me, who, you know, was, um, as I try and explain this to my students, uh, I carry many of the traditional cards for a fully paid up member of the Irish national community. Um, we also had a quite a high number, about 250 migrants some of whom see themselves as hyphenated Irish, and some of whom are resident in Ireland but don't see themselves as Irish at all. Um, and thanks to a colleague, we have quite a high number of Irish travellers as well, who we have shown in previous work often feel as if they're marginalised and peripheral to the national group, even though they are Irish travellers. Um, so we know that groups that are more marginal tend to get a harder time out in the street, um, uh, generally. Um, and this is something that I've written about before. Um, so we were interested in how this played out relative to um, adherence to public health messaging. So what we find is that people who don't feel that they're prototypically Irish, so who can't say things like I just said, you know, I see myself as a fully paid up member of the national community. Um, because I, I was born in Ireland, I have Irish parents, I can speak some Irish, I have an Irish name, that those people who don't feel like that, they tend to not feel as included um, in the national group. They're not getting as much solidarity and that's impacting on their adherence to public health messaging. Um, we also found that income or employment group mattered. So people who don't feel uh, for whatever reason um, that they have been minded by the national group don't seem to be doing as well at adherence. Um, we are in, so we're, with this paper just about written up, I'll be able to send it to anybody that wants it on Monday or Tuesday, we're sending it away for publication. Um, but we are, we have looked now at psychological well-being as well. Um, and there does seem to be something going on there as well. Um, so in terms of stress, we know isolation and mental health are they're, they're inherently linked. Um, we know from the last um, SARS problem, um, so effectively the SARS-1, um, that it really mattered um, how long people were quarantined and whether they were quarantined. And that you tend to find that people show uh, symptoms of post-traumatic stress if they're quarantined for too long. And in particular, post-traumatic stress tends to be a comorbid problem. So by that, I mean that the WHO tells us that about 80 something percent of people who have post-traumatic stress have another psychological problem. So it's not an independent problem. Um, and we know that many of our young people um, from uh, lots of different surveys over the years, we know that many of our young people um, have a problem with depression. So here we have kind of a risk for older people that's physical and a risk for younger people that may look more psychological. And I think that we really have to think about ways of managing that going forward because we're asking our young people to do a lot of these self-isolating actions uh, in support of older people. Um, but in the national community, many of our younger people um, they, they can feel a little bit left behind 
um, they can feel a little bit excluded. So I think when we think about the national community, I, I, I'm sort of trying to do the take home uh, message of you know, how we can think about these things. Um, as we think about these things, I think one of the things that has stood in our favor as we've tackled um, the COVID crisis is that there is a strong sense of national community in Ireland, which myself and my social psychology colleagues would talk about as being a sort of a social cure. It's a way of connecting and including people, of getting people to comply or adhere to guidelines. It's a way of making people feel that they belong. It's a, it's a support for mental health. And Irish people have a strong history of protecting each other. Um, so if we think about the Irish diaspora, this is something that Irish people do. So we can use that to a sense of yes we can to drive a sense of yes we can and that will connect with irish people and i think that's the social cure part the downside of that strong sense of national community is um, that we tend to have very strong boundary policing and authenticity policing around national identity um, i think it was Enda Kenny, who famously said to uh, somebody in Galway that they weren't even from Galway when they heard their accent and the, the person had been born, born in Ireland away, so it was kind of a migrant Irish. So, I mean, we do, and that kind of thing tends to be um, reasonably um, usual, if you like, in Ireland. So we can inadvertently make subgroups meaningful. We, um, so if we think of um, um, uh, that kind of example of migrant accent can be enough to make a subgroup meaningful. Um, but we have also seen how in the COVID crisis, um, particular, particular groups that are marginal groups that are subject to attack often in other ways, um, have been uh, marginalized and made to feel sort of problematic. Um, probably the one that I've noticed most, again, it speaks to why uh, people notice things, but the one I've noticed most is women who've gone to the supermarket with children. Um, so we've heard a lot about single parents and particularly single mothers going to the, the supermarket uh, and having other people reprimand them. Um, so what's happening there is we're inadvertently making uh, single motherhood, which is a long track record of, of being a marginal identity in Ireland. We're making it meaningful again. But we also have this emerging uh, uh, groups, um, the Covidiots. Um, uh, so the, the people who went to Cheltenham were being revert, referred to as Covidiots. Um, early on, we had people who went skiing. There was a lot of chat about, I never knew so many people went skiing. So skiers were somehow different. Um, so there was an us and them about those who skied and had enough money to ski. So that, that, those kinds of distinctions. Um, and then the group that's going to become increasingly important because they might see themselves as immune and therefore they might feel like they can do what they want is the recovered group, people who've had COVID and are, are back on their feet. Um, so in some regards, the, because we have a strong sense of national community, we can be quite quick to correct and overcorrect people. And that can make people, it can push people outside and make them feel attacked rather than in the group. And as much as we might be annoyed by Covidiots, we have to keep them on board. We have to keep as many people as possible on board. And what I hear in the narrative about people who are not complying is anger. Whereas in fact, what we have to do is find a way of communicating with them that they have to stay on board. Not least because a huge amount of what matters in health is not about health. So if we look at the, this issue of vaccine, um, we have loads and loads of information about vaccine hesitancy and vaccine denial. It's a social issue. It's really not a health issue. And it's about social trust. So if we react to groups in a negative or sort of acrimonious or um, aggressive way, uh, those who don't comply, actually we're only going to increase the likelihood that they won't take up the vaccine when the time comes. Um, so we need to play 
to all being in it together. And of course, that's all said in the context of national, but we live in Europe and we're part of the European Union and this is a global problem. So, you know, I can, I'm kind of seeing how I can sort this and I'm thinking about how you know, sort this out at national level, but actually it needs to be sorted out as a sort of how we're all in, in it together, European wide and globally. So what's my take home message? It's that we have divisions in our society that predate this crisis. The big ones that we had going into the election were to do with differences across the generations in terms of wealth, access to housing. We've had a long history of a distinction between settled people and travellers, homeless and uh, people who are homeless has become a bit, had become a big issue in advance of the election. Gender has always been an issue in Irish society, certainly in my lifetime. Increasingly issue of migrant status had been, um, had become an issue in the last 20, 25 years. And the issue of inequality and poverty um, has certainly been back since the turn of uh, century. So these divisions matter to people and because they matter to people, how they hear messages, a huge amount of how they feel about themselves is to do with um, these status and the, these sense of themse themselves or ourselves as a woman or as a mother or as a young person or a middle-aged person or a new Irish or old Irish. And therefore we engage with messaging differently. So when we do our messaging, it's really important that we don't step on these cracks, that we find a way of staying connected and being as inclusive to our fellow citizens as we possibly can, or possibly even our fellow global citizens. So that's it. So sorry for the technical hitch. Sorry, uh, thank you very much, Lauren. I think if you just unshare uh, the, the screen now. And... Oh, crikey. <laughs> 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 just when I thought it was over. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> and if I could just ask the other panellists to turn their videos uh, back on and I'll just unmute them now. So, um, I, Molly, are you there? Sorry, Liam, uh, you, I think you're required to start my video since you stopped it. So, uh, okay, sorry. I'm trying to uh, start it again. But, uh, Perfect. Uh, so we've got everyone now. So thank you everyone for the questions and thank, I mean, I would say it's just incredible. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've obviously seen a lot of your work, but just to see the amount of work that's been done in, in really what's been four or five weeks uh, from so many different perspectives and so on. I mean, and, and also to thank you a lot for agreeing to do this event in, in the space of a week. So I, I, I'm, I know a lot of the attendees here and I know every one of them will appreciate it or certainly a lot of them that I know will appreciate this a lot. So thank you very much. Um, I just wanna, we've got about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. So it'll be relatively brief maybe, but um, uh, so I just wanna start with some clarifications that people have. So for you, Pete, uh, I think there was a couple of people saying, and I think this had something you had addressed before uh, is, the, the posters look a bit busy. So would you, do, do you think of those as being posters that you're designing to actually put up or are you thinking them more in terms of testing mechanisms and so on? Yeah, so th this is a complete omission on my part in the presentation. I mean, the poster in fact was almost designed not to be very professional in its, in its superficial aspect. So we designed the three posters to be evenly matched and that meant that we had to kind of match the superficial aspects of the poster to the control poster because what we're interested in is the underlying central message about infecting the specified uh, vulnerable person or the numbers of people you might infect so we're in no way testing posters that we think would make good posters what you're trying to do is find the effective message and in fact the fact that the posters were bad posters as judged by the people makes the the result arguably more important because what it's actually telling you is that the central mechanism that was the difference between the posters was was more effective so the hope is that having identified um, as you say a mechanism that's effective a, a kind of specific message that works that then people who can design much better and more professional looking posters than I can and my team can will then do that with the central message so that's what we're trying to do yeah 
And I think there's a question maybe for, for Orla about whether you, whether you think there's something in the case that young people have been unfairly uh, targeted or made, made a, a particular a group that was particularly sort of not complying. Uh, do, do you have any thoughts on whether, whether the, the, the sort of creation of a, of a, of a stigma against uh, young people was, was a feature of, of the early part? Um, <clears throat> I think it has been a little bit of a feature um, and I think there's nothing to be gained from it. Um, young people need to be on board as much as anybody else, but I do think it has been a feature of it, yeah, but I, th I think then a, the other issue is that issues of housing are really central for young people and COVID intersects with those issues. Um, so, uh, and young people often feel let down by um, or did up until, I think that's why we saw the election results we did. I think they have felt left down by mainstream Irish society. And then um, all of a sudden it's incumbent upon them to act to protect others. So there is, that, that's difficult. Certainly I have had um, students say to me uh, things, things like, oh, so us snowflakes need to go now into, um, in, before we're fully trained into the hospitals and act as uh, act as the people who will be healthcare workers and I think that's ex I mean these are exactly the issues these issues of fairness speak to issues of solidarity and I think you can only do solidarity if you tolerate everybody in a, a kind of kind and compassionate way and I have a oh sorry sorry go ahead Mark. Yeah, Liam, I might come in just on that issue. And I suppose uh, I think young, young adults in particular highlight a group that um, I think we need to be very careful about how we're targeting our messages. And I suppose I'm involved in some research in another area, focusing on young adults. And we've been very proactive in developing patient and public involvement in the research. So we have a very active young adult panel who work with the research team. They're part of the research team to inform what we do. You know, I'm very conscious that we're sitting around largely as middle-aged people. Well, some of us are a little on the, the more positive side of that, but I'm certainly in the middle-aged side of that. I have no clue how 19-year-olds interact with each other or their priorities or the messaging. So I do think a very important thing nationally is that we do need to get really good stakeholder engagement. We need to get young people really involved in informing how we're messaging and communicating about public health uh, because I think not only are their lives and how their lives they're, they're being lived are generally quite different maybe from, from other groups but I think how they receive the messages where they're getting their information are likely to be different as well so I think it would be really good if we could move towards um, a bit more PPI and engaging particular groups and I think young adults uh, would be a particular uh, high need group to, to develop these kinds of strategies. Um, we're getting in a lot of really good questions so I just want to summarize maybe a couple of them by saying and I'll, I'll leave it open to whoever wants to take the question that uh, we're getting a few questions along the lines of uh, do we think that message fatigue is going to become an issue and in particular do we have any thoughts on uh, the timing of the message, which I think is a similar question, so that you know there may be a difference from trying to tell people to be to physically distance themselves, wash their hands, do all this type of stuff when the pandemic is hit, compared to what's going to happen in the next few weeks. And do we think that there's risks for either people becoming complacent simply because they've habituated to the risk, or that they may simply disengage from the risk messages? And do you have any thoughts on the implications the, of that? So I guess. Is, does the messaging need to be different as time goes on from when it starts? I mean, I might come in initially, uh, Liam, just to say that I think there is a real paradox here in terms of keeping motivation high and reframing messages to keep interest and keep motivation. So I do think there is an element of we have to keep looking at energizing those messages and seeing how those are being received. However, I also think there's a very fundamental principle from behavioral science, which is around easy habitual behaviors are really where we're hoping to go with this. So, I mean, I think on behaviors such as social distancing, ideally what we need to move towards in the next uh, month or so is that basically being at a distance from people has to be so habitual for us that we can't even 
imagine that we would go closer to people or whatever. So I suppose there's a, a few issues at play there. So I think ideally what we need to be moving towards is moving these behaviours to be more habitual. So it's less about what we're hearing in the messages and therefore that kind of message fatigue is going to be less of an issue. Anyone else want to come in on that? Pete? Yeah, I, I mean, it's an absolutely vital issue. And the great problem that we have is that the situation we find ourselves in is unprecedented. We genuinely have never done anything like this before. So we don't really have evidence on how to keep it going over a long period. But we do know uh, that it is possible to maintain cooperation and have people making sacrifices for long periods of time for the common good. It can be done. So we shouldn't lose heart from that. I do think there is something to be said for freshness of messages. And one of the things, the reasons I keep talking about feedback is I think feedback is an opportunity to do that because it's an opportunity to genuinely monitor progress and potentially monitor progress towards identifiable goals that will make our lives more easy. Now, there we get into, of course, the whole business of what the exit strategy should look like. But how we communicate the exit strategy and what it should look like interact. And, you know, if we are going to go in quite short steps where we're giving consistent feedback on how well we're doing, and we can get that into messages that the public can understand so they can see cause and effect between their behavior, the return to some kind of um, greater freedoms and how well we are doing as a society against some kind of metrics. I think that would hugely help because that would mean the story evolves as a narrative that people can engage with. And I think that's going to be really important. But we've never been here before. That's a hunch on my part. I really don't know. And um, so another, another question that's, uh, that's coming up is um, the testing itself. So uh, do, does anyone have any thoughts about the behavioral issues around when we start seeing things like uh, antibody testing or even, even the, the technologies that will emerge around apps or in general, when people start to know their status and know the extent to which they've come in contact with folks like, do we have any sort of sense of what the what the sort of behavioural issues are there in terms of people interacting with complicated technologies and having to understand tests and having to, you know, do these types of things? Uh, I think one of the key things about the testing will become uh, if somebody realises that they ha already have had COVID and presume themselves to be um, immune, which I'm not sure we can presume, but I think people may. I think exactly the issue that Pete raised around norms um, and who you see out and about, um, that's going to become more and more prevalent. I'm going to see more people who presume they're okay out and about. So um, if I'm reading off others, other people's behaviour, actually it's increasingly apparent that there's more people out and the invisible stay-at-homers are, are not there. Um, so how people read the change in what's going on um, will really will become crucial. Um, I think somebody has typed into the um, text box uh, something about, you know, do you target subgroups for particular messaging? Um, and I think at some point we have to engage with that. Um, we have to, uh, and at some point, the messaging needs to move much more to an online forum to to deal with younger people, um, rather than um, you know pamphlets being posted to householders. Um, and at some point, somebody with a sense of humour is going to have to get involved <laughs> to um, to light up the online world with messaging that. Uh, people will engage with without offending people without you know I'm not talking about black humor but I am talking there I have seen some good examples online um, but I from what I can make out of the online world your a meme is crucial if you want to reach the sort of 15 to 22 um, you're nobody if you don't have a couple of memes Colleagues, I'm going to, if you, if you don't mind, I'm just going to run over for two or three minutes. We were scheduled to finish at 1320. So I'll just, I'm just going to take one, uh, two more questions and then finish. So, because I think there was just two important questions that I think would be good to address. And, and the first one is, could be, um, what sort of mental health consequences? So this, this partly goes back to both, both presentations. What sort of mental health consequences do we see throughout the next uh, few months 
and how should policy be thinking about that now? And one one questioner in particular mentioned the issue of grief. Yeah, well, I, I think the issue of grief is really important. Will I take that? Yeah. Do you want it, Molly? Um, so one of the things I think, and there's a lot of people writing about it, and I've certainly heard people on the radio talk about it, one of the things that Irish people do well um, is, is supporting other people in their grief. I think you only have to go to a funeral in England to have that feeling of what is going on here. I mean, yeah. like it is a very different experience. Um, Irish people really do um, show up uh, and, and support their neighbours, their friends um, when somebody dies. And I think that, that is going to be an issue because, uh, and indeed for many people, they won't even have um, seen um, loved ones. Certainly in my own family, we have a, a situation that has arisen and I have two siblings in the States who are not going to get to see the person who is dying, you know, how they won't be able to attend the funeral. So there's all these kinds of issues that, 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 that will come back and have to be dealt with. Um, so I think that we need to think about as things move forward, you know, how are we going to manage that for the very many people in the restricted period? Um, because of we, what, one thing we know about bereavement is that it is associated with depression um, for young and old. So if we don't find a way of putting in those really well-formed natural supports, at some point, we're going to have a very, um, a very at-risk group in young and old who have been bereaved. So I think that really has to be dealt with. Suspended funerals, I don't know, memorials, or some new way of dealing with. And um, Molly, did you want to come in or will I? Um... Yeah, I mean, I guess, Liam, you know, uh, there is an element of that we don't know um, in this situation. And I suppose for the majority of people who will experience stress, anxiety and depression, maybe specifically in the shorter term as we're responding to the restrictions, for the majority of those people, um, they are likely to move out of that if it's very specifically related to adjusting to the pandemic. I suppose what we need to be very mindful of nationally is, is higher risk groups, so more vulnerable groups for whom um, you know, they may already have underlying or experience, past experience of mental health problems for whom a situation like this where they're denied of their usual routines of their regular social contact maybe of their health services um i think are a very vulnerable group and i think that we very uh, we definitely need to ensure that those more vulnerable groups are supported as, as well as possible at this time well i have just one one final question um, uh, which is um do we see any permanent behavioural change arising from this? And I know this is going to be pretty speculative, but it, it is an interesting time to think about as, as habits change. And in particular, people, a number of questioners have mentioned climate change. Mm. And is, there, is there anything worth speculating on in terms of how behaviour might change post-COVID, uh, Pete? Uh, yes, uh, there's some evidence that communities that go through uh, extremely torrid times like wars and so on actually do pull together and produce a kind of more communitarian politics afterwards. They start to believe that it's possible to act together and do things more in a communitarian fashion afterwards. So there is, there is some evidence in political science for that. So yes, that could happen. But the other legacy issue I worry about is, I think there are a large number of people, I mean, they're a minority, but I think there are a large number who probably wish they never understood how a respiratory virus was communicated. And suddenly there are a very large number of people who do understand that. And some of them, I think, are finding that psychologically really quite difficult to cope with. And I think it will probably change their behaviour for quite a long period of time. Any other thoughts? OK, folks, um, thank you very much again. I just want to thank our speakers. Uh, it's really rather a difficult thing to do to put together a talk in the space of a few days in an emerging situation and uh, I mean I, I know each of the speakers and I learned a lot today as well so uh, I hope the attendees enjoyed it and learned something uh, from it and thank you very much for your questions and engagement the the videos and the slides will be made available and I've also put together a reading list on the topic which will be up on the which will be up on the web so um, 
Uh, thank you very much. I wish I'd give you a proper applause to this.